Welcome back, everyone. Okay, I think the first panel was an excellent lead-in to the topic today, and then we'll continue on with our next panel. I'd like to welcome everyone back from the break. I'm going to add a couple of uh, notes here. If you're on the webcast, you will, would please refresh your link. We've updated the uh, question link on that. So if you're on the webcast, update your link, and we will... Um, there will be a way for you to submit questions. We have one question we've received and plan to address that later in the day at the wrap-up as we have time, but that will come later. So um, our next panel, panels uh, are up. So we'll start off with um, Fire Chief Bill Jones with the L.A. County Fire Department. He'll talk about the L.A. County Fire Department's response to the Aliso Canyon event. So without further ado, Chief Jones. Thank you for being here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Steve and everybody involved with this uh, workshop for inviting us here. I think it's an important topic. It's something obviously near and dear to us in Alley County Fire Department. I'm not the fire chief. I'm a division chief. I'm going to be talking about uh, the fire department's response as well as one of the division's uh, response, the Health Hazmat Division uh, in Alley County. And just to give you a little bit of background, uh, the uh, L.A. County Fire's uh, Health Hazmat Division is uh, a regulatory component of the fire department. We uh, inspect and regulate uh, industries and businesses and facilities that handle hazardous materials, generate hazardous waste, and uh, have underground tanks, above ground tanks, and other programs. Um, we do this under what's called the Unified Program. It's a state certification program to do what we do. Uh, we basically have six program elements that we regulate. Aliso Canyon is one of them, but we're dealing with the has waste and the hazmat and the above and below ground tanks uh, and fire safety issues, uh, not what the wells, what's going on with the wells uh, below ground. Uh, in our division, we also have uh, folks that get involved with cleanup of these sites. Uh, we also have a criminal investigations uh, component in our division and a very robust uh, emergency operations section that works hand in hand with our fire station personnel on these kinds of uh, situations. So uh, when we talk about L.A. County, just to give you some perspective, the L.A. County area has about, uh, well, over 10 million people. Uh, there's 88 cities there. It's over 4,000 square miles. And we're one of 30 uh, fire departments in the county of Los Angeles, the two largest being L.A. County and L.A. City. So. Looking at the map of L.A. County, if you haven't uh, got a perspective of where this uh, facility is, this is the location where that star is. This is the entire San Fernando Valley here. Here's downtown Los Angeles that somebody was mentioning. You could see from the hills above Porter Ranch here. Zooming in a little bit, what you have here is the uh, SS25 uh, well that was leaking. And the line that's drawn from the well down to about right here is about five miles out. And odors of the mercaptans uh, that are in these uh, natural gases uh, were being detected down five miles from that well. And, and in fact, even further beyond that, because this is where I live. And uh, I live actually south of this area. And even I was picking up some of the, one, some of the odors of the mercaptans uh, south of there. But, one of the things that you can see is that there are a lot of folks impacted potentially by the odors that were going on uh, from uh, the release. And the main concern, of course, uh, was the methane, but uh, the one that was really causing a lot of the problems were the mercaptans uh, that are found uh, in these natural gases. Sorry about that. It kind of went ahead. So this particular slide uh, shows something that I wanted to point out. Uh, this is uh, the housing area just south of the Aliso Canyon facility. The jurisdiction is that LA County Fire jurisdiction is up above here, and LA City Fire has pretty much all of the residences and south. The San Fernando Valley is essentially uh, an LA City suburb, and so when it comes to life safety and EMS, uh, L.A. City 
uh, is the responding agency. But in this particular case, when you talk about uh, the Aliso Canyon facility, it's actually in L.A. County Fire's jurisdiction, but through a mutual aid compact that we have with L.A. City, uh, the station that is right down this road here, which is Tampa Avenue, is the first in engine if anything were to happen at the Aliso Canyon facility. And then they would call uh, the L.A. County Resources, which is about four miles away in this direction in the city of Chatsworth. So I don't need to go over this. I think you've uh, seen some of the statistics. What I hope to do this uh, morning is kind of give uh, a timeline and some stories about what happened uh, from our perspective, both from the uh, LA Fire perspective as well as the HAZMAT perspective. And from those comments and from those experiences, hopefully you'll draw some uh, you know, thoughts and, and some things that you can take back to your uh, respective shops. So uh, as uh, was mentioned, the leak started on 1023. It was a Friday. Uh, on 1024, there were numerous, numerous uh, calls to the 911 system. Uh, LA City Fire actually responded on that Saturday. They went up to the front gate, and they were told that they had a, a, a downhole leak and that uh, they were looking at it, and uh, they hoped to get it uh, fixed pretty quickly. Uh, they also made uh, a call uh, to LA County Fire Dispatch, and I want to play the dispatch itself because I think it's important to recognize that when this thing first started rolling out, there wasn't a heightened sense of uh, concern. It was something that happened, something that they were going to deal with rapidly, and hopefully in the next day or two it would be gone. So hopefully this works. Angeles County Fire. Hey, how you doing? My name is Ramon Marquez. Um, I'm with SoCal Gas. How you doing today? Good. How are you, sir? Good. Uh, I just want to uh, think you guys were up here already. And I just want to let you know what, uh, we're still in the process of working on the uh, on a downhole leak. Uh, you may you may get uh, complaints from my neighbors. And where is that at? Uh, right here in, uh, in Northridge. Oh, in Northridge. Northridge. You need a you actually no. need LAC no. then. No, no, we called them, but we just uh, we'd like to give you guys a heads up. Oh, okay. Uh, just in case you guys get any complaints or or if uh, the gas travels through. Oh, okay, uh, got it. So. All right, appreciate it. Uh, what, what, what was your uh, badge number? 64. 64? Yes, sir. All right. How, how are you? The next question was actually, how long do you think you guys are going to be there? And the response was uh, something to effect, oh, we should wrap this up hopefully by the, by the end of the day and uh, hopefully sooner than that. So the point being that uh, in the initial stages of this incident, uh, there was uh, uh, comments being made that gave the county fire dispatch the impression that it was going to be done quickly. Um, it turns out it wasn't going to be, and uh, Boots and Coots obviously uh, was uh, starting to roll out on Monday now. Um, you know, in California, there's a requirement that any company that has a spill or release has to make a notification to uh, the California Office of Emergency Services and to the local unified program. Uh, to, to, until Monday, there was not that notification, uh, at least to the unified program agency. There was a notification on Monday made to OES, Office of Emergency Services, uh, and we happened to get that email that had that notification and decided that we better take a look at this because we were a little bit familiar with this location. We kind of knew what was happening uh, you know, at this facility just from a regulatory standpoint. So we decided to send a team out uh, that afternoon when we finally got the notification through OES, not directly from uh, Southern California Gas. And uh, we, we started talking to some people. We ran into what's uh, a group uh, from the South Coast Air Quality Management District that were uh, present on site or uh, in the area uh, monitoring the odors uh, since the uh, calls first started coming in on Saturday. Uh, in our assessment at that time, we were also told, uh, you know, that we had this situation going on, but uh, we hope to resolve it uh, quickly. Uh, we made notifications to local stations, and this is one of the lessons learned from us. Uh, the crew that was on at that time didn't have any clue what was going on, and even though the engine company before that uh, in the shift 
uh, went up there and had a discussion with Southern, for Southern California Gas. So um, just to give you the time frame and, and what was going on, you know, we, we started having meetings on a daily basis. Uh, we had a meeting, obviously, with Southern California, California Gas and started looking at monitoring, air monitoring, not only in their fence line areas, but also in the community. Uh, on 11-4, we had our first community meeting, and this was really an important community meeting because it really brought out a lot of the passion and a lot of the anger that were in uh, the residents that lived nearby, not only from this particular release, but from what they, they had uh, experienced for uh, months and perhaps years before that. Uh, so it was a, a good uh, interaction with the community. It's something that uh, highlighted the uh, importance uh, of, of dealing with this particular situation. Now, we went through all the, uh, I think Al uh, Walker from Dogger talked about all the well kill attempts, and, and what we were doing is, is sort of uh, being told that these well ki uh, kills were going on, uh, and they were hoping that it would happen, and we were hoping that in the first, second, third maybe well kill that it would uh, kill the well. Uh, that was not uh, the case, uh, as it turns out. Uh, but at the same time, we launched an investigation. We started collecting information. We started looking at the notification issue. We actually uh, issued notices, uh, you know, uh, from the fire department. And, um, you know, I want to give you a sense that on a daily basis, we were talking about this situation. We were uh, talking to other people. We are trying to get a handle on all the different agencies that were involved uh, at this point and what their involvement exactly was, what direction they were headed. Uh, obviously, the Department of Public Health had a key role because uh, there were a lot of community health concerns. So uh, a lot of discussions going on. When we had the third well kill on November 13th, something happened that was a little bit different. And what happened is what we called the misting event. And the oil, the crude oil, basically was blown out of the hole, and it carried into the residential areas about a mile to a mile and a half away. They didn't expect that to happen, but it did happen, and it coated some of the backyards and, and some of the houses with this mist. Now, from a, a response perspective, uh, not knowing uh, what was going on was really important to point out because uh, this happened, and we had lots of complaints from neighbors at that point, and we weren't really sure what we were dealing with, but we had to jump on it. We had uh, an, a, sort of a little mini emergency response within the emergency response, and, and Essentially, if, uh, eventually we found out what it was and we dealt with it. Uh, on 11-17, the fire department brought in what we call a short IMT team, uh, incident management team. We have four of these teams in Alley County Fire, mostly to deal with fires, and we've had a few this season that have been going on, uh, but also to deal with all hazards. So at this point, based on the information we were getting from Southern California Gas, again, we thought that it would soon be resolved. Uh, so we bought what we call the short team, and this was to help out Southern California Gas in uh, preparing what's called an incident action plan and to plan activities on a daily basis, uh, you know, in terms of what was going to be happening. On 11-19, and Katie will be talking about this a little later, uh, Public Health uh, issued a directive uh, for Southern California Gas to provide temporary relocation of the residences. We weren't calling for a mandatory evacuation at that point. In fact, a lot of the residents stayed in their homes, uh, but a lot of them took advantage of this uh, opportunity to move out once it was made available. At the same time, there was uh, a lot of activity uh, on the part of uh, Southern California Gas and others to try and control the, uh, the odorants, the mercaptans, because that, again, was the driving force for a lot of the complaints that were happening in the community. Uh, and we used the material, uh, we didn't, but they were proposing a material uh, from a company called uh, Odex, and this material was supposed to suppress uh, the mercaptans that were coming out of the hole. Uh, again, at that point, we didn't recognize or realize the full scope of how much gas was coming out and the rate that the gas was coming out. Uh, and uh, once we started getting those videos with the uh, infrared, it was very clear that this was not a good idea. First of all, because of the amount that was coming out, but secondly, because we were trying to find out what was in this uh, ODEX, and it turned out that it had some solvents, and uh, we didn't think pumping out that much suppressant 
in a relatively large area to suppress the odors uh, was a good thing. And from the uh, residential perspective, using this material to cover up something that was bad with something that was also potentially bad was just not a good optic. So uh, as mentioned before, we had 12-4 uh, to relief well number one was started. Uh, we also had, from emergency standpoint, uh, a lot of aircraft and helicopters, particularly from the media flying, were directly over the site. So we imposed a temporary flight, uh, flight restriction. Uh, it was issued by the FAA, and uh, that was at uh, our request. And uh, soon thereafter, a lot of those flights uh, diminished. We did have some violations, several in fact, and we did report those to the FAA. So that's just another component of this particular situation that we were having to deal with. On 1216, we talked about the schools in the area, students being relocated. That was huge because anytime you have a situation like this and you involve kids, it's hugely, hugely passionate. And you don't want to discount the fact that you have to deal with uh, the kids that were still going to school in that area possibly being impacted. So a good call was made by public health uh, to move those kids out of the schools in the area uh, to schools uh, uh, that were further away. On 122, uh, we, um, oh, I'm sorry, 113, we had another proposal by Southern California Gas to control uh, what was going up uh, from this uh, well. And the idea was to try and capture as much of the methane up at the wellhead that they could and then pump it into either uh, a combustion uh, mode or, or store it and, and then treat it and then use it eventually. Uh, from a fire perspective, given the winds that were up there, given the amount of gas that was up there, we did not think this was a good idea. And I think most people in this room would probably concur given the dynamics of, of this particular situation. On January 22nd, we went into Unified Command, and that's full-scale IMT Unified Command. And I'll tell you a little bit about why we didn't do that initially uh, in a few moments. And then, of course, we all know uh, in February uh, when the well was finally controlled. So from a fire department perspective, uh, when we're not involved with putting out the fire or dealing with the mitigation, it's, it's a little bit out of our ball game, if you will, when we have a situation where the responsible party is solely uh, involved with their consultants with mitigating whatever is going on. So one of the reasons why we didn't go into unified command immediately is because there was a lot of uh, responsibility on the part of Southern California Gas to, to do the mitigation that was necessary um, in order to uh, mitigate this leak. We were also told that it would be fixed soon. We had that impression for maybe a month. We didn't think it would go as long as it did. So we hesitated to bring on the full uh, IMT uh, and, and deal with the situation through that. Um, the fire department was not in direct communication with a lot of the players. And Al, that was a great slide showing all of the agencies that were involved. That is what we were dealing with from a command perspective, from a fire department perspective, from a management perspective. Dealing with that many agencies was just not overwhelming, but it was something that had to be managed and managed well. Uh, so not having direct communication with a lot of these uh, key players, Dogger and AQMD and some of those folks, was really uh, not a, a downside or a lesson learned, but something that we're going to try to improve in the future, certainly. Uh, so in terms of why did we decide to go into unified command? Uh, midstream. One of the things that we noticed is that there were all these agencies that are out there doing their thing, and a lot of them were doing things independently of anybody else, and they weren't telling anybody what was going on. And that's a huge flaw uh, and, and something that, that we needed to get control of. And by going into Unified Command, we had a little bit more control of that. Uh, for example, there were air quality people that were going out there doing sampling, Results weren't being shared as uh, quickly as possible and taking action in terms of holding hearings and doing different things uh, without telling anybody else. And, and frankly, at the command post, we were finding out these things more or less by rumor. And so uh, leading up to that point where we went into unified command, that was just the way things were happening. So around the beginning of December, we actually started corralling as many of the uh, cooperating agencies that we 
heard of being involved with this particular incident, and we started having weekly meetings and sometimes more frequently than that, just to get some intel, just to hopefully get everybody working on the same page. There were hundreds of samples being taken. I mentioned something uh, earlier on where Southern California Gas went into a voluntary uh, sampling mode, but there were also lots of samples being taken by the South Coast Air Quality Management District. There were samples being taken, and this is air quality and downstream type of samples uh, being taken by uh, private vendors that were being hired by uh, some of the residents, by other entities that were taking these samples. And we were getting bits and pieces of the sample analysis through media releases or through rumors or whatever. So the uh, samples had to be uh, managed, and one of the ways that we did that was by, you know, essentially uh, bringing this uh, unified command on scene. Uh, the well kills obviously weren't working. We had up to seven well kills. And, and so we eventually went into Unified Command. So what did Unified Command bring once we established it? Well, first of all, there was a command post set up on site. And one of the things about this particular incident that was different, uh, usually when we have a command post set up for a fire or something like that, we bring in all the agencies and we bring in all the resources. Uh, the logistical support that we bring is through the resources that we have set up. In this particular case, Southern California Gas provided a lot of the logistical support. And we had a lot of folks, a lot of agencies coming on site that had to be coordinated. And, uh, you know, we were working out of a small trailer in the beginning, and that we said, you know, we need bigger trailers and we need more room. And the next morning, there were two big trailers there. And then we were parking in this dirt lot, and it was raining and it was muddy. And we said, boy, that's, that's pretty terrible, you know, that, that's going on. And, and the next day, they paved the whole lot. I mean, that's the kind of logistical support that Southern California Gas freely did uh, under this kind of situation. And what Unified Command brings is obviously all of those components of logistics and safety, uh, coordinating the cooperating agency, uh, you know, solidifying and, and formalizing the planning events because planning is critical in any kind of big disaster. And you have to put all of the responsible entities and who the key players are uh, within what we call an incident action plan. And uh, in this particular case, we decided after a lot of discussion to go into Unified Command with public health and with Southern California Gas. Now, that's not an anomaly. When we have a big fire at a refinery, we often go into Unified Command with their fire brigades. It's just necessary because they have a knowledge and a wherewithal of their facility and their resources that brings a lot of value to the Unified Command. So in this particular case, uh, we had the potential, well, we had the responsible party, potential uh, defendants in any cases down the road, obviously the people that the community had a lot of concern about, in unified command, and, and frankly, it worked uh, pretty well from what we were uh, trying to accomplish. The one thing that we did bring in in unified command from the fire uh, perspective, and actually uh, we did that in, in the month uh, or so before, is we started bringing in resources to the site. We started staging engine companies. We started staging other resources when there was critical activity occurring. When these well attempts kept on blowing out, that hole started getting bigger. You know, we didn't know at the time what was down that hole, and there was Boots and Coots people on board building these rickety old bridges over the hole, and, and we didn't know what would happen if they fell down, if they'd, you know, be like Alice in Wonderland and keep on going, or, uh, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, they'd be in, a, in, in 10 feet of uh, muck. So we stage our urban search and rescue team out there. We also said, if you have an injury or if we have, uh, an ex you know, uh, if it catches on fire or if somebody has a heart attack, you know, they're going to have to not only uh, get an EMS squad up that uh, windy road, but they're also going to have to go back down, and uh, it would take a lot of time. So we decided, we talked to Southern California Gas, and we said, you know, it would be a real good idea if you had a helicopter pad up there. And they uh, essentially built a helicopter pad up there so we could fly in our uh, helicopters and evacuate people that might have uh, come into trouble there. So, let me just, uh, as far as the lessons learned and, and the observations, you know, we, we certainly had uh, challenges with regulatory agencies. And I'm not saying that in a negative vein. What I'm saying is there were so many uh, that had a job to do and that were up there uh, that it was uh, a management challenge for us to uh, manage that. And, when we're in what we call the active dynamic stage of this uh, particular incident, and that's when the gas was being released, 
uh, one of the things that we wanted to make sure through the command post is that everybody was checking in. And some of the agencies didn't feel that they had to do that or should do that, and they felt that they, uh, you know, needed to and should be allowed to go up and just do whatever they wanted to do up on the site. And, and that was uh, nixed uh, through the Unified Command. And, you know, another thing is that there was certainly a continuing safety concern up at the site, and people had to be briefed on that and not just go up there and do whatever they want. The second thing is, from uh, our perspective, we had a focus on, on dealing with the leak. We didn't want the resources that were brought in from Southern California gas or by Southern California gas to be diverted by a regulatory uh, investigation or a regulatory, I want to talk to you for the next two hours, three hours, whatever, about what happened type of scenario. So we, under Unified Command, uh, kept the focus on mitigating the release, and we said, no, we're not going to let you do that uh, because those folks up there that you might want to talk to uh, had a lot of work in front of them that had to be focused on mitigating this release. Uh, and if there was a safety issue, obviously, that trumped anything. And there were some things that were brought up by Cal OSHA, and uh, we, we emphasized to Southern California Gas, you've got to be compliant with Cal OSHA requirements, and they would stop and readjust and so on and so forth. So the other thing that that was sort of a nuance of this and, and not in terms of your all experience with these kind of situations is there was no, uh, you know, set way to mitigate the release. What, the impression that we are getting is let's throw this down the hole and see if that works. Let's throw that down the hole and see if that works. Seven times that was done. And it was just, I, I saw golf balls. Hey, I, I would have liked to get a few golf balls. But anyway, uh, you know, they were throwing everything down the hole that they thought might work. And as it turns out, none of them worked. Uh, so that's something different from a fire perspective. We usually try and attack it directly and, and a lot of, not every time, but most of the time, you put wet stuff on the red stuff and it, and it puts it out. As far as uh, another observation, commander's intent, and I don't know where I am on time, uh, if somebody could raise their hand or get the hook out if I'm going too over. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess that solves that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, do I get an added two minutes just for uh, technical challenges? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm pretty close. Yeah. Okay. So just uh, to kind of. Uh, start wrapping up here. One of the things, uh, again, that we uh, noticed, um, public information, I, I'll make mention of that, was, was really big. And there was a lot of agencies putting out public information. And uh, sometimes the uh, message was different. Sometimes it was uh, not consistent with uh, what was being put out by Unified Command. So Unified Command brought all that together. We formed the JIC, and that started working uh, a lot better. Uh, as far as recommendations, uh, pre-planning and drills, obviously, uh, are, I don't know what's going on here, but <laughs> it's just not cooperating. Uh, pre-planning and drills uh, are, are really important, and I bring that out because uh, one of the things that uh, is going on in California is we have a huge initiative uh, to deal with uh, refineries uh, and the incident that happens at uh, refineries, and one of the key components of a reg package that is actually coming out today is pre-planning and drills, and not just with fire brigades, but also with the regulatory community that will obviously be responding to these kind of incidents too. The same thing can uh, be applied uh, here. As far as uh, uh, cooperating agencies, uh, I think it's really important that we, we talk about this from the perspective of all the agencies that were involved and how we can communicate better. Um, from our perspective, uh, one, of the, one of the programs that we uh, uh, oversee is called CALARP, the California Accidental Release and Prevention Program that has, has to do with risk management at high-risk facilities. And because the definition of stationary source in federal uh, regs precludes us from, uh, you know, enforcing stationary sources like this, uh, and because it's not defined as a stationary source, there's actually a present preemption, it keeps us out of the domain of the CALARP universe that we can regulate. And I think that might be helpful to look at that
from the standpoint of us being involved with regulating these kind of facilities. From the fire, fire chief standpoint, he's very clear. He wants more local involvement with these kind of facilities. More local involvement, not, not to get into what Dogger is doing or what some of the other agencies are doing, but doing what we do in terms of fire prevention or CalARP or whatever the case might be. We think it's uh, really important. There's a lot of bills, as mentioned, uh, going through the California legislature. Uh, we're still, uh, you know, trying to coordinate uh, our comments and our response to a lot of those. I think uh, Al mentioned earlier about uh, the risk management component there. We have risk management uh, folks and experts in our uh, division and in other uh, unified program agencies throughout the state of California, and, and they're uh, very much in tune with a lot of what is being proposed in the regulations, so I would recommend that we have that discussion. Uh, I think also in terms of uh, general duty, uh, we're looking at that as an enhancement for enforcement purposes. Uh, also, um, you know, I think uh, Al showed that slide with the three C's. That was, that was something that we developed at the command post under Unified Command because whenever we were talking about what needed to be done, uh, the engineers and everything immediately started diving into, well, we have to do this, 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 and this. And that really got clouded in terms of what was being messaged to the community. So when we came up with those three C's, it was really uh, a nifty little tool to communicate not only within Unified Command, but with the community at large, too. So think about those kind of things uh, to communicate more effectively, clearly, and simply to not only the responding agencies, but also to the community at large. And, and lastly, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, from a fire perspective, uh, there's a story about Abraham Lincoln, and he was told uh, he had to chop down a tree, and he was told he had five days to di do it. And what he did is he spent three days sharpening his axe and two actually chopping down the tree. And from a fire perspective, it's really important to get those three days of training and, uh, you know, exercising and drills or whatever the case might be prior to actually having to deal with that scenario. So. Uh, I thank you again for inviting me. I hope I didn't go too much over time, and I'll, I'll wait till later for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Jones. I must say, I tell you, I think the timekeepers and I were, were enthralled with your, your presentation there. We, 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 we lost track of time, but we're still in good shape. Um, appreciate your remarks. Uh, you know, it's fascinating to hear you put together the, the story of the response and appreciate, obviously, the uh, efforts that uh, the fire service put in, in that, uh, to that end. Um, you know, and the lessons learned, the recommendations that were developed, we certainly will take to heart as we, we move forward. As you might have guessed, this, this panel is, uh, you know, we're talking about the impacts on people and the environment. It's a very important component of, of the conversation on, on safety. So. Um, we, we cover the gamut uh, in that regard. Next, we'll have a speaker from the Kansas Corporation Commission. You may or may not be aware, Kansas Corporation Commission is one of our state partners that oversees pipeline safety in the state of Kansas. So to that end, we'll have Ryan Hoffman with the Kansas Corporation Commission to give a, some remarks. Um, and they, uh, as was mentioned earlier, were one of the states that was actually impacted by an accident back in uh, Hutchinson, Kansas. And let's see, where is, oh, there we go, there we go, got that right. Well, uh, normally when I, I speak to a group of people, I like to start out with a kind of a personal funny story uh, to try and get the, I would say that the discussion started, but uh, those stories generally involve my wife. And when I found out that this was going to be uh, available on YouTube for later distribution, I decided against that because I like being married. Uh, and one of the things that I would uh, echo from what you've heard from most of the people today is, is gratitude for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, and I'd like to thank FEMSA for that. I'd also like to thank DOE for, for the prior two days. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank 
uh, states first for the opportunity to be here on Monday and, and work on this issue with other states. Uh, and I would also be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Leo Hanos, who is the, the director of our Pipeline Safety Division, who uh, kind of volunteered me to do this. Uh, <laughs> and he did that simply because he said, you know, gas regulation is, is under your purview, not mine. So storage, I should say, so why don't you, you do this? You'll be in Colorado anyways. And so, Leo, if you're watching and listening, I just want you to know how grateful I am. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to, to return the favor. Uh, I have a disclaimer here, and, and the reason I do this every time I speak is probably because it was beat into my head in law school that you should always give a caveat before you speak, and you should never speak in, in absolutes. And uh, it's also important to me that I, I, I let you all know, and then I have it in writing, that when I talk today, I'm talking about uh, my opinions and, and my, uh, I would say, uh, it, I'm not expressing the official views of, of the commission or any of the, the commissioners because they're smart people and they can do that. You mentioned Hutchinson, Kansas and the, the Yagi incident and, and this is, is why I'm here, really. Um, this is downtown Hutchinson, Kansas uh, in 2001. Uh, here's another picture of the same thing. And what you're looking at is uh, their downtown area that was uh, hit by uh, a natural gas explosion from gas that had migrated away from a storage field. That storage field is, is up there in the, the upper corner in the little red, uh, almost rectangle. Uh, and the, the town of Hutchinson there, you can see it's not uh, a sprawling metropolis, but it is you know, roughly 40,000 people. And uh, what happened is that this field was originally developed in the 1980s uh, for storage of propane. Uh, that propane uh, storage operation was abandoned, the wells were plugged. Uh, then in the early 1990s, uh, the cement was drilled out and the field was con converted to natural gas storage. And there were approximately 70 wells, 62 of them were in use at the time of the disaster. Uh, the field could hold about three and a half billion uh, cubic feet of gas at 600 PSI. And at the time, it was the only natural gas storage facility, uh, salt cavern facility in Kansas. And I would also like to point to yesterday, there was a, a really good discussion of the history of this event, so I won't go too much into it and know that when those materials are available, uh, you'll be able to look it up there. So what happened uh, on the morning of January 17th, there were two explosions in downtown Hutchinson, and, and two of the businesses were engulfed in flames fairly quickly. Uh, a lot of the other businesses suffered some sort of damage that would result from the explosions, but uh, thankfully there were, there were just minor injuries. Uh, originally, the, this, the officials believed that the fire was a cause of a, a natural gas line leak, and uh, as they found out that when they put something wet on the something red, the fire wasn't going out. So there had to be something else going on. And uh, what they found uh, later on was they were notified by the, the storage field operator that they had had a, a, a massive pressure drop at one of their, their jugs. And uh, they had noticed it over, over several days that the, the pressure began falling off and then, then dramatically fell off. Well, later that night, uh, around the town of Hutchinson, gas geysers appeared and they would spew gas and salt water into the air and they were finding their way to the surface through abandoned brine wells. The Hutchinson area is, is famous for its salt and it's fairly shallow so it's easy to mine and it's been going on for a long time. So there are a lot of wells out there that maybe were plugged, or if they were plugged, they were plugged to the standards of their day, so they weren't uh, able to withstand the, the pressures that they were encountering. And then the next morning is, is when uh, this event became more tragic, and that's when one of those gas geysers uh, ignited a mobile home, and two people uh, died from their injuries sustained in, in that explosion. All in all, uh, 143 million MCF of gas uh, were lost from the storage site. And this is just a, a review of the map. The, you can see the, the downtown area, I hope, uh, where the explosion happened. And then there's a, a blue rectangle there where people were evacuated. That was where the, the mobile home uh, park was located and also where a lot of the, the geysers appeared. So, what happened, it's, it's much kind of like this, this scenario right now where there was an incident and, and now there's a response. 
Well, in Kansas, after this incident, our legislature uh, passed a bill. And they said, somebody needs to regulate this. And what they did is they established a, a two-pronged approach. And for that, they said, the, the KCC, you're the oil and gas division, you handle the porosity gas storage in uh, the Department of Health and Environment, was already dealing with uh, salt solution mining and, and storage in salt caverns. So they said, we want you to, to do that. And in the process, they did allow for a two-year moratorium on storage in embedded salt and uh, we adopted our regulations uh, in 2002. Uh, KDHE followed the next year. And uh, a little side note there that to date, Yagi is still the only natural gas uh, cavern storage facility in Kansas, but it's not operational uh, as we heard yesterday. And it, it would not meet the permitting requirements of the regulations and that the, the brines are current, or the, the caverns are currently filled with brine. So that leads us to to this map, and this map shows the the 17 storage fields in the state of Kansas. And I just would point out that you'll see that there are, are red numbers and blue numbers. And the blue are the intrastate fields and the red are the interstate fields. And the reason that, dis that distinction is important will be more evident later. Well, I'm gonna walk you through our regulations and I'm gonna do this really quickly because even though I'm an attorney, I I don't like reading regulations, and I think it's even worse trying to read them to people. Uh, I would just recommend that if you want to look at these closer, you can go to our website. They're, they're available there, and it, if you have questions about the website, I can, I can provide that later. Two of, the, two of the terms that we define are actually underground porosity gas storage and uh, what, what a storage facility is, and I would point out that uh, the storage facility definition is important, especially in light of, of where things are headed nowadays, and that it, it includes the wellbore, tubular goods, the wellhead, and any related equipment. So you can see that it, it's more than just the, the storage reservoir. Uh, we have a provision that if an operator files anything with FERC, they need to file it with us. And the, we have a provision for provisional permits. The reason we did this is because we had storage in place when the the statutes were passed, but we didn't have regulations. So we needed to have a, a process in place to issue permits to people uh, so they could continue operating their storage fields and uh, work towards getting permanent, uh, per permanent uh, operating permits. And 103 outlines that. That's a three-page uh, regulation. I, I would recommend you look at that if you're really interested in, in what it takes to obtain a permit in Kansas. I just probably could talk about it for 20 minutes if that were the, the case. So uh, I give it a short shrift here. In 1004, I think one of the important things is that any new storage fields that are, are gonna be permitted have to have a, a provision for public notice. And you see that there's an opportun opportunity for uh, a protest and, and notice for a hearing in this. So uh, there are also uh, other notification requirements. We have five-year testing requirements, and uh, it's actually prescriptive in that it requires staff to witness at least 25% of those tests. Currently, we, we witness greater than 50% of those tests, and there are, there are monetary penalties for, for failing to test the wells and, and failing to repair them. Uh, we do have a requirement for leak detector inspections at least once a year, and the very bottom bullet there is interesting in one, cent, one sense because it's not unusual for our regulations to say that each day of a continuing violation represents a separate violation, meaning that if it's a $500 penalty, it's each day it's $500. What's interesting to me is that it actually provides for aggravating factors if they're present and allows the commission to escalate the penalty. That's not something that's present in any of our other regulations. We have provisions for monitoring and reporting. Uh, the wellhead pressure is potential leaks, gas metering, and, and monthly volume. And again, you can see there, there are monetary penalties established for each of those. We have requirement that identification signs be placed at the wells and the compressor stations. Uh, we require annual safety inspections where the operator has to notify us at least 10 days in advance of, of the safety inspection that they're gonna do it so that we could be there to witness. And you see that they have to file their report with us at least 30 days after that, that uh, inspection takes place and I have the criteria listed there. You, you can see that 
what, what needs to be included in that inspection. And I also have a little asterisk there by the, the monetary penalties going forward. I figured I wouldn't belabor the point, but it, it goes to say that the, wherever that asterisk is present, it means that it's, it's potentially a continuing violation that, that has uh, aggravating factors present. Uh, we have requirements for transferring storage field operations, uh, plugging storage wells, uh, temporarily abandoning a storage facility, or even decommissioning or abandoning a storage facility. And then the, the last regulation there is how we funded our program or how we fund our program, and that is through license fees. And there's an annual well fee and then, and then license fee, and I, I have the differences for the provisional and the full operating permit. So that, that's one area of our experience, and the other is, uh, unfortunately, on the legal side of things. And there are two main areas that uh, are impacted legally, and that's who owns the storage gas and then also jurisdiction. Ownership's an issue because Kansas is a rule of capture state. Uh, everybody out there who knows what I mean by rule of capture, please raise your hand. Oh, good. For those of you who, who don't, uh, it's because early on in oil and gas law, uh, minerals were considered to be similar to wild animals. And the minerals would travel under the surface without regard for boundaries, just like wild animals do on the surface. So just like you can't own a wild animal, you can't own a mineral until you capture it. And that's, that's the, the, the thought there, and I have a, a quote from, from one of the early cases that, that lays that out. We also had challenges to the rule of capture when it came to, to storage gas. And the first came uh, in Wichita, the Beach Aircraft Facility had uh, their airplane manufacturing operations there. They had a, a natural gas storage field to, to support their their manufacturing processes. Well, there was a well that was drilled on the adjoining property, and imagine this, it, it was a wonderful well. Uh, the operator was able to produce uh, consistent volumes over a consistent period of time and never really had any problems. Uh, I believe in this case, at some point in time, that one of the judges said, it's, it's a perfect kind of well if you can find one of those. Uh, and, and the court determined that Beach lost uh, the right to the gas when it migrated off their property and that it was consistent with Kansas's uh, adherence to the rule of capture that once somebody else captured that gas that migrated out of the storage field, it was theirs. And I, I've bolded and underlined something in that third bullet point that I, I think was maybe an omen of sort from the court and that it said if, if there were changes that needed to be made to the rule of capture as it pertained to storage gas, that it would, it would be a matter of legislative action. I've got two other cases cited there in case you like to read. Um, but in 1993, the legislature went ahead and enacted a statute that uh, limited the applicability of uh, the rule of capture to storage gas. And you can see here that it, it stated that the gas shall at all times remain uh, the property of the injector. And that at no time shall it belong to the person who has uh, the surface rights. And that uh, explicitly here says that you, you know, the law of capture does not apply. And another interesting thing in this, this uh, portion of the, the statute is that it still allows the owners of the surface and, and the minerals to drill through storage fields. So uh, that was recognized as, as a, a right. And in 1210C is where you get into, well, what happens to the gas that migrates off the property? Well. It, it says that the, the injector shall not lose title so long as they can prove by a preponderance of the evidence that it is theirs. And further, it gives the injector the ability to uh, cause the, the owner of the other adjoining wells to run tests on them to verify that the gas is not the gas that had escaped from the, the storage field. But it also provides that if they're unable to prove that, that the owner of the adjoining property is uh, has the ability to recover costs, uh, due compensation, including reasonable attorney fees, and in the event that uh, the injector cannot prove that that is their gas. And it gives them the right, the injector the right to compel all of, all of those things through an injunction or other appropriate relief. And as you can see here, litigation ensued. And I have a couple of cases here that kind of go through it, and I'm going to fly through them pretty quickly, but it, as you can see here, a lot of the early cases 
that tried to, to look into the, the, the claim or enforce the statute were unsuccessful. Uh, in, in this one, it was because uh, the operator was barred from recovery due to a statute of limitations. Uh, uh, and in the next case here, they lost it because they couldn't prove that it migrated uh, after the effective date of the statute. Then came uh, the, the Northern Natural Gas versus One Oak Field uh, Services here. And uh, Judge Schmisher uh, in Pratt, I think, had a, an unenvi unenviable task in the sense that uh, gas had migrated beyond the adjoining properties. And it was, well, the determination needed to be made, well, who owned the right to produce that gas? And the judge looked at Kansas case history and said, you know, the statute says adjoining. We know what adjoining means. If it goes beyond the property that is directly uh, touching the, the gas storage field, then it's, it's no longer the owner of the storage field. And uh, Northern Natural appealed that case to the Kansas Supreme Court, and uh, the Kansas Supreme Court agreed with the, the lower court and said that subsection C provides that, you know, the rule of capture still exists for gas that goes beyond uh, adjoining property. So another case, and one that is probably more pertinent and, and even relevant today, is the, the CIG versus Wright case. And I, I've got a little timeline here. And, uh, the most important thing is that to think about this in the context of when it happened. I, I mentioned before that we had the process of provisional permits. And then you had to convert that provisional to a full-time authorization. Well, in this matter, uh, the, the full-time permit had never been granted. And it got to a point where uh, our staff at the time uh, had even threatened to potentially shut in the storage field because they were not meeting the, the requirements as they saw fit. And I think at that that's the point in time when the operator said, that's enough. Uh, we're going to go to court. And the court in this case really looked at our regulation in two aspects, and that was permitting and safety. And they said that, you know, permitting involves preemption issues that are related to FERC's authority and that safety uh, uh, goes to the Department of Transportation under the Pipeline Safety Act. Uh, our legal team at the time put uh, forth several arguments regarding what exactly pipeline and facility meant in those, uh, the way they were used in those acts, and uh, they were thoroughly uh, taken apart by the court. Uh, and the, the court found that FERC has exclusive jurisdiction over the rates and facilities in interstate natural gas, for interstate natural gas companies. And that's, that's all operations. And then you can see also that they said our, our regulations were plainly focused upon regulating a field that's exclusively occupied by FERC's permitting authority. And then likewise, the, the Pipeline Safety Act uh, forbid any state uh, safety regulation over pipeline transportation or pipeline facilities. And in the case, uh, I mentioned we, we argued pipeline and, and facility and what they meant. Well. This court found that storage is part of that facility, that uh, um, essentially any, anything that the, the KCC did in their regulations was expressly preempted because it was related to safety of, of those things that are already covered by the Pipeline Safety Act. So that brings us back to this map. And, and what you have here are uh, the, the fields as they, they are today, we have six intra-state fields, 102 wells, and then there are uh, 11 fields with roughly 725 wells that are interstate. And, and what that means for all intents and purposes is that the regulations I, I've outlined for you apply to those 102 wells, and those are, are the, the fields where we enforce those regulations. And, uh, again, I'd like to, to thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you today. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll wait to see if there are any questions later on. Thank you very much, Ryan. I'll tell you, that last case you mentioned is one that's been a topic of conversation for years <laughs> with the, the Office of Pipeline Safety. Appreciate your discussion on the various uh, cases that have uh, come up in Kansas.
Okay, next up, we're going to shift gears here a bit and talk about public health. Um, and here representing the Los Angeles County Fire, uh, Department of Public Health is Katie Butler. So welcome, Katie. Let me get your... <laughs> I think. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Katie Butler. I am an environmental epidemiologist with the Los Angeles County Public Health Department. And um, I consider myself very fortunate. I work with a unique team of public health workers uh, consisting of a medical toxicologist. We have environmental epidemiologists on our team, public health nurses, um, other medical doctors, and community health workers. Um, that were all really critical in our public health response to the SS-25 incident. And one of our priorities of our, our team at LA County Health is to really take a close look at communities that are in close, pro you know, close proximity to industry and really ask ourselves what kind of policies, what kind of regulations um, can we leverage in order to protect the health of people in, in Los Angeles area. Um, Chief, Chief Jones mentioned we have 11 million people in Los Angeles, so that's a tall order. We have in our eyes 11 million patients that the health department addresses on a daily basis. So thank you for, for inviting me here today to, ch to share the public health perspective. And um, I, I'm going to focus on our public health response activities, both during the SS-25 incident um, and after the well capping so that, um, you know, to date you can get a full update on our public health activities. So we were notified of the gas leak on October 28th and that it had reached the community and people were being affected by the odors in the community. So at that time, we reviewed the, the available air monitoring data to to understand what we're dealing with here in terms of um, chemicals that we're concerned about that could be reaching the community, um, what are the health effects that we might expect, and we really narrowed it down to these priority chemicals of concern in the initial days of the leak. So methane, we know, um, you know, over 90 percent of methane uh, constitutes natural gas, and of course methane alone is not considered harmful in this type of setting when it's emitted in an outdoor environment. Um, we're normally concerned about methane in an enclosed space for flammability reasons. However, um, it served as an important indicator for us uh, throughout the incident for other chemicals that could be in this complex gas mixture and for chemicals that we could not measure. So the sulfur odorants um, as many of you know, our noses can detect them before our laboratory instruments can detect them. So throughout the entire incident in the community, we did not have one measurable level of a sulfur odorant. They were all below laboratory detection limits. However, the odor was so persistent and, and that was the main constituent of concern causing the health effects. So that in itself created a very difficult public health messaging challenge um, because something we can't measure, we can't quantify, is affecting people's health. So that's why methane was important as an indicator for us. Um, hydrogen sulfide was something that we identified early on as a concern. Um, however, it, it did not reach levels in the community that um, posed a health threat at all, and it, it was very rarely detected. So um, even though in the initial days that was something we had a close eye on, that ended up not posing a concern for us. And then we had benzene and other volatile gases, um, you know, that come along for the ride. And from our toxicology point of view, benzene, even if it is present in small amounts, is something that we want to keep a very close eye on because it's a known cancer-causing agent um, linked with, you know, causing leukemia. And so um, benzene is something from the start that was routinely monitored for, and we, we were able to collect, synthesize all of that data 
um, that the gas company and the air agencies were collecting and our responsibility was to interpret that and provide the health um, interpretation to the public. And so we did that for the first time at the November 4th community meeting, which was a very important meeting for us to really understand how people were being affected by the odors on a regular basis, um, even in, in those first few days. Um, and, and so after that community meeting, we realized we needed to very closely monitor this situation to gauge how long it would take to stop the flow of gas. Because at this time, we, we were under the impression that it would only take several days or a week at most. Um, and, and the symptoms people were experiencing, even though they were severe for some, maybe they could be tolerated for that week duration. But if it went much longer, we knew in our minds that we would have to increase our response and we would have to do something more to protect the people in this community. So to give you an idea of the symptoms that people reported at that November 4th community meeting and the symptoms that we know are associated with sulfur odorants, um, the most commonly reported symptoms are headaches, nausea, uh, dizziness. Um, nosebleeds is something that was being reported as a result of this incident. However, it's not known to be associated with sulfur odorants. So the, the animal and human studies we have on the sulfur odorants do not indicate that nosebleeds um, are, can be a result of, of um, smelling the odor. So that also led us to believe that um, we are dealing with a complex mixture here and, and there could be some uncertainty there um, in our conclusion. Um, respiratory difficulty like um, chest tightness, um, Throat irritation also was very commonly reported, um, eye irritation and, and coughing. So to give you an idea of the extent of the symptoms that were reported to our office, here's a map that we, we created in the midst of the incident um, that represents just over 500 residents who called our office to report a symptom they believed was related to the gas leak. And at this point, we really had to ask ourselves, what can we do to protect the health of these people experiencing symptoms with really no um, end in sight of the gas leak um, in, in mid-November? And you can see here on the map that the symptoms were reported very consistently out to a five-mile radius. And we had reports beyond the five-mile radius, um, and those those um, often were people with pre-existing chronic disease, um, people who may be more sensitive to the odors. Um, and so we really saw a wide variety of um, people's response to the odors, really depended on the individual's um, sensitivity, their health history. And so it was important for us as a health department to take into consideration um, each person has their own health history, their own case. Um, and it has their own merit. Um, and so it was difficult to generalize the severity of the symptoms on a broad basis for that reason. And you can also see that from this map, um, the highest density of complaints really in the center portion of Porter Ranch community. And I like to point this out because um, it made sense to us conceptually that the flow of gas was coming down a central canyon there off the hill in Aliso Canyon and really affecting the majority of residents in the, the central portion of Porter Ranch um, because it, it is a very hilly area and the canyon um, pathway there made sense to us. Um, and so on the, the east and western portions, you know, there's a lower density of symptoms, but it is spotty as well because the winds are highly variable in this area. So when we asked ourselves that question, what do we do um, in response to these symptoms, uh, we, we don't have a definitive timeline of when the gas leak will stop. And so that's when the public health department issued a directive to the gas company to relocate anyone who was being impacted by, by the odors. And 
That occurred on November 19th. At the same time, we issued a preliminary environmental health assessment of the monitoring data we had evaluated to that point. And we concluded that the odors, they are causing significant symptoms um, to the point that people need to relocate because the only remedy is to get away from the area, to get away from the odors. And when people left the area, say for a day trip or weekend, they would immediately experience relief of the symptoms. So these symptoms uh, cause immediate contact toxicity, uh, and it's not something that builds up in their bodies. Um, and that was illustrated by the fact their symptoms are immediately relieved when they leave the area. So we knew that this was the prescription, in a sense, that we had to administer to the community, which was to relocate to get away from the odors. And this was followed by a supplemental directive in the same vein to relocate for the schools in early December. And we had to, we, we really wanted to make all of these decisions based on good science, on solid data. And so that school directive was really based on our evaluation of nurse office visits. We had very good data for both of the schools and we could compare it to the previous years to, to see, yes, in fact, there is a substantial increase in office visits and we have increased symptoms amongst the children. And it's important to realize both of the schools, they are on either end of the community. They're not in that central canyon area. So um, the odors were more fleeting and, and I think that's part of the reason why they weren't a part of the original directive. So after the, relocate, the directive to relocate folks, um, at this time, we kind of reorganized ourselves to gear up for a response over a longer term because we didn't know when the gas leak would be stopped. And so um, actually thanks to a lot of the groundwork that Chief Jones laid in coordinating agencies at the local and state levels, we were able to gather together a team of air and health agencies and um, come together to identify what do we need to monitor for. Remember, we had our short list of chemicals of concern, methane, sulfur odorants, and benzene. But now, we need to gear up for a longer-term response. We need to really make sure we understand what's in the natural gas mixture that's being emitted. And so this, and, and exactly the extent of it. So as a group, uh, the multi-agency team, we decided how can we strategically place the monitoring locations so we can get good coverage, um, how can we ensure we meet data quality objectives so we can accurately assess health with stricter laboratory reporting limits, and then expand the anal analytical list of chemicals. Because remember, this gas facility is unique in the sense that it was previously a crude oil extraction reservoir. So we have now a longer list of chemicals of concern from our public health perspective of material that could be admitted from this field. So we're not just dealing with natural gas, but also crude oil and possibly the drilling muds that are being ejected out for each of those well kill attempts. And that was evidenced by the misting event um, that Chief Jones mentioned uh, December 13th. So we wanted to make sure we were really um, understanding the full list of chemicals that could be related. And then also collecting samples over a time period, a 24 hour time period, as opposed to an hour, so that we can get a better understanding of that long term exposure people might have. And it was a very extensive monitoring effort by all of the agencies and the gas company. Daily measurements were being collected um, throughout the community from dozens of stations from dozens of sampling points, um, including the schools. And uh, it, was a, it was a great team effort by the local agencies, LA County Fire Hazmat and Public Health. They both conducted random spot checks of the gas company's uh, field sampling protocols um, so that we could make sure we had consistent methods out there in the field. Um, and, and then in the end, we were able to synthesize the data. And that, again, that's our public health uh, department's responsibility is to interpret all of the findings. 
So to give you an idea of the air agency monitoring locations, uh, they had eight fixed stations. And then on top of this, um, the gas company had six uh, points on the facility. They had uh, about a dozen more locations in the community. And then they had six fence line monitoring sites. So we were creating a wealth of data here, which means we have a wealth of information to report out to the community, to interpret, to communicate. And I wanted to show you uh, one of the graphs that we published in the first air monitoring report. Um, once we were in that unified command structure, uh, we were much more disciplined and there was a, um, a better vehicle for us to create weekly reports of all the air monitoring results. And this really helped our ability to communicate with the public. So we would publish the, the data along with our health interpretation so that people, they could go to our website, they could find what are the latest monitoring results and what are the health implications. So here's a graph of outdoor methane levels. Um, the daily maximum levels that are reported between November and January when our first report came out. And um, you can see that they're you know, well above two parts per million, which is what we ex expect normal background levels to be. Again, these levels were not considered harmful to health, but we use it as an indicator to understand um, what the other chemicals of concern might be doing. And so benzene is something that we kept a close eye on. Um, here you can see the highest benzene levels were in early November, and that's when it went from a leak to a full blowout. So it made sense to us that we saw the highest benzene levels there. Uh, again, these are daily maximum benzene levels, and they never exceeded our threshold for short-term effects which is eight parts per billion in the state of California. And for long term, we needed to closely monitor these uh, to make sure that they did not consistently stay above one part per billion. So on average for the whole incident, they, they, uh, they averaged out to about 0.3 to 0.5 parts per billion, which was higher for the Porter Ranch area because remember it's not um, an urban area. Um, like downtown Los Angeles, for, uh, for example. Um, so it, it was slightly higher for the Porter Ranch area on average, um, but it was still within what we expect to see benzene in outdoor air in other places in Los Angeles. And an important piece of the expanded monitoring plan was to test for the full list of chemicals that could be related to crude oil, like metals, like the black soot material, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, things that at, at low concentrations have the potential to be harmful and understand if those are also being emitted from the well. Um, this sampling was not conducted until late January, um, so it is a data gap. We don't have a full understanding of the, these chemical concentrations during November, during, during the height of emissions. Um, so we did find elevated levels of these compounds here on the facility just 500 feet south of the well, and we did not find them upwind of the well. So that told us that these are coming out um, because they were on site. The, the purpose of these samples was really source attribution. Um, as opposed to estimating health effects in the community. And in summary, during the leak, um, you know, the sulfur odorant still appeared to be the primary constituent responsible for the symptoms. And this was based on the available data that we have, um, based on another health study that was done in Alabama where a full tank of mercaptan um, is had leaked into the community and people experienced th the same list of symptoms um, except for nosebleeds and diarrhea were two things that they did not experience as a result to that sulfur odorant only exposure but we did see in Porter Ranch area. Um, so I want to move into the post-leak response 
And this methane graph illustrates what the air, the methane air levels did. You know, they, con they considerably dropped that day after leak control. And, you know, in the last few months, they have been um, what we expect to see for background in Los Angeles around the two part per million mark. And when this drop occurred, um, as the health department, we expected the community um, to stop reporting symptoms because we no longer have the odorant uh, causing, causing a problem. We no longer have any emissions coming out. Um, and so that week after the gas leak was controlled, we were very surprised to start receiving a flood of calls from people who attempted to move back home and continued to experience symptoms. And some of the, some of the calls to our office were clearly um, related to cold and flu season. Remember, it's February. This is the height of flu season. And, um, you know, people might report they have a fever along with congestion that clearly points to uh, the direction of a viral, viral infection or something like that. Um, but just within that first week, the call, the, the number of calls was, um, it's, it, it was so much higher than we expected. And the story started to be very consistent in people going back home for several hours, feeling eye, nose, throat irritation, feeling headaches, and then when they left, their symptoms would go away again. So the same symptoms, very similar list that they were experiencing previously, were now being reported to our office at the end of February after the gas leak was capped. The other report that we started receiving frequently was that oily residue was being found on outdoor surfaces, including outdoor per patio furniture, um, siding of houses, playground equipment, and in some cases, there were larger droplets, but in some other cases, there were very small speckles, so it was difficult to discern them from, you know, typical wear on paint or, or your um, rain gutter. So this is something that was reported just a handful of times in mid-December, um, and so we thought that the scope was very limited to, to maybe a handful of homes that were the closest to that misting event and that it was a very isolated issue. Um, but to, d to date, the gas company has sent inspectors out and confirmed that this oily residue is on 1,200 homes and has used solvent and, um, you know, appropriate methods to clean it off the outdoor surfaces. And it makes sense to us that this could be a byproduct of, of the leak just due to the history of it being a crude oil field. It was analyzed and found that there's long chain hydrocarbons, so it is consistent with crude oil. We didn't find any of the more toxic uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, that black soot material. Um, and so it, it's very stuck on, and it doesn't pose any kind of immediate health hazard. Um, if, if you rub your arm on it, you know, it might cause some skin irritation, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, for the long term, it's best that you know, people clean it off the surfaces and um, take care of it just so that it, it doesn't present that dermal, dermal health concern. And uh, this is the density map of symptoms reported in the month after the gas leak. So this represents about two to 300 symptoms that were reported, and you can see the pattern is about the same in the most affected areas. So in response to this, we mobilized very quickly to do two things. Uh, community assessment to understand the real scope of health problems after the leak, and then also what type of exposure are we dealing with? What's actually causing these symptoms? People reported the symptoms occurring indoors more frequently than outdoors, so we first went into the indoor environment to take samples and understand what might what residual material could still be there. We did this in a multi-agency work group. Um, US EPA and CARB especially were instrumental along with our outside experts so that we could develop a robust sampling plan. 
So the CASPER is a CDC uh, method to get a representative sample of the health status of a community. And the beauty of it is it's great for emer emergency response. It allows us to deploy 40 to 50 health workers in the Porter Ranch area in two to three days and collect a door-to-door -door survey of health symptoms, um, presence of the oily residue, other issues, health issues that people are having. So we did this exact this door-to-door -door survey within a three-mile radius of the well and it's a representative sample again so it's very different than the calls we're receiving to our office. Um, this is a non-biased source of health data for us. And we surveyed people about their symptoms during the incident and after and we saw a decrease from 81 percent to 63 um, percent. So still you have the majority of people, 63 percent, reporting symptoms in the month after the gas leak was capped. The majority of these people sought medical care, so that tells us as the health department that the symptoms are serious enough, that people are seeing their medical provider. And again, the same pattern was happening where people would leave the area, their symptoms would be um, lessened or diminished um, when they leave the, the, their home or the Porter Ranch area. Uh, we were surprised to see that 41% of households reported odors still after the gas leak was sealed, and 35% reported the oily residue. 12% didn't know if they noticed the oily residue. Again, it, it is difficult to determine if it's on your home or not if, if you're not accustomed to looking for it. So once we knew we had an increase in, in health symptoms, more than what we would expect, we then launched quickly into the second phase of our post-leak response, which is the indoor sampling. And it really consisted of two components. So we had household dust samples, and then we also had indoor air sampling. And we tested for almost 300 chemicals that could possibly be associated with crude oil, with natural gas, and with the drilling muds. And the household dust findings concluded that the metals we found in the Porter Ranch area were higher concentrations and reported with more frequency than our comparison area. So we had a set of homes six miles away that we did the exact same protocol so that we could have a good reference population. And this pattern, fingerprint of metals, it was statistically significant. It, it stood out to us as very unique. And so um, we tested for those same metals in the soil around SS25. And we also looked to the drilling mud ingredient lists. And we found similar metals in the drilling muds and the soils around SS25. So that suggested to us that there's this logical explanation. The drilling mud metals may have entered the homes in these finer particles that were misted out um, during the well kill attempts. And these metals, they were found at very low concentrations um, that wouldn't pose a health threat for long-term issues, but it's possible that they could be contributing to some of the irritation symptoms we were observing, like skin rashes, eye, nose, throat irritation. Um, and the air sampling showed that the levels of chemicals inside the Porter Ranch homes were very similar to our comparison area, so we didn't find anything that seemed out of the ordinary there. It seemed very consistent with what we would expect to find in our indoor home environments. So based on those indoor sampling findings, based on our health study that showed there is still a presence of symptoms in the Porter Ranch area, our department recommended some moving back home um, steps for residents to get their homes professionally cleaned, to ventilate, um, to clean air ducts, to change out air filters, um, to maintain air purifiers that they were, um, they were provided by the gas company with air purifiers in many cases, and to spot treat oily residue. Um, the other thing is to launder all the clothing, um, especially for houses that are closest to the, the well. Um, you know, we did have reports of itchy skin after wearing clothes that was not laundered. Um, so simply laundering clothes and bedding has proven effective for many people to, to um, 
minimize the symptoms they're experiencing. So we issued a directive on May 13th for the gas company to clean homes located in Porter Ranch, any, anyone that was relocated, and then also within the five miles of SS25, um, because that symptom map of, that we have based on our um, complaints to our office, based on our interviews with residents, and understanding of the extent of, of the leak, um, really pointed to us that the five mile radius um, is where the majority of residents experience symptoms. And on May 20th, the judge ordered the gas company to complete the cleaning for households in number two here, the relocated population. And so um, now all of the residents have moved back home, um, but we still continue to get reports of symptoms to our office. Um, and since cleaning has been conducted for only a portion of those households that the health officer has recommended, um, we, we, do, we still are recommending cleaning and ventilation as two really key steps for the community to restore and to move forward. Um, so even though everyone is back home, um, you know, the community, there's still a lot, we still have a lot of work to do to, to rebuild and to restore the community. And thank you again for your time. Hopefully I didn't go too over. Okay, thank you so much, Katie. Appreciate that perspective on the public health impacts of Aliso Canyon. Again, we'll hold the questions until uh, uh, the very end. And by the way, if you're listening by webcast, you, you can go ahead and submit questions and we'll just have them teed up for when we do go to that session. You don't have to wait till, till we have the Q&A session, but you can go ahead. Next up, we'll be hearing from the Environmental Defense Fund. And I'd like to start by, you know, in introducing EDF with, um, I guess will be a tag team with Scott Anderson and Adam Peltz. Um, just wanted to recognize your leadership on the area of methane emissions, certainly with, with the pipeline industry. We've worked uh, together with EDF for, for a few years now. And actually, they're represented on, on our advisory committee, and which is our statutorily mandated uh, committee that advises the Office of Pipeline Safety on, on policy setting. Um, recognize their uh, representation on that committee uh, through Mark Brownstein uh, of EDF. But up to, uh, again, to uh, provide a perspective uh, from the Environmental Defense Fund, again, Scott Anderson and Adam Peltz, and I'll bring your presentation up here. So I'm Scott, and uh, Adam and I will be splitting EDF's time. We're very uh, pleased to have been invited. Um, gas storage wells are not just pipelines that are vertical rather than horizontal. And my top line uh, message today is that regulating the integrity of these wells uh, requires significant and specialized expertise. And in order for government regulations to play a meaningful role in uh, regulating uh, the, these, these facilities, uh, it's going to require more than simply telling industry to uh, follow industry standards. As Alan Mayberry mentioned this morning, uh, the big question is, uh, or at least suggested, uh, the, the big question is uh, where do we need to go beyond uh, the industry standards? Adam is going to talk about some of the operational issues that relate to that question. And I'm going to raise three related questions that EDF uh, urges PHMSA to consider. Uh, first one is, uh, how can PHMSA, which until now has never regulated wells, make use of state expertise, especially for interstate facilities, given that Congress has preempted state safety regulation of interstate transportation and storage? Uh, and how, how can they do this, given that there are many differences among state well integrity rules? Now, the second question uh, that we would pose is, uh, given that API 1170 and 1171 are quite explicit, uh, that they are not all inclusive and that they are not intended 
or that they are intended to supplement rather than replace uh, state and federal regulations uh, and, and local, I guess I would add. Uh, how, how can risk management requirements be based on these RPs uh, without leaving significant gaps and creating a situation where industry is simply regulating itself? And my third question is where will the money come from? Uh, both federal and state regulators will need uh, significantly uh, more money uh, in order to enhance oversight of storage facilities. I, I, I don't have an answer, I'm afraid, to that last question on funding, uh, but we do have a few suggestions to make today on the first two questions. Um, as, to the, as to the first one, uh, how can FEMSA make use of state expertise, uh, we have two uh, suggestions, one for interstate, one for intrastate. As, as to wells associated with interstate facilities, we urge FEMSA to ask its legal advisors uh, to do some uh, deep and creative thinking uh, about how the agency can enforce a very key provision in the February uh, 2016 advisory bulletin. Uh, that bulletin says that operators must adhere to applicable state regulations for the permitting, drilling, completion, and operation of storage wells. That's a very important instruction from an environmental viewpoint and a public safety viewpoint, but it may require creative lawyering in order to enforce it in light of the statutory pre preemption provisions as interpreted by the federal district court uh, in Kansas. Uh, we heard earlier today that under the uh, uh, section 6106, I think it is, um, agent uh, agreements with states for pipelines that states cannot inspect and enforce more stringent state regulations. And that may be a plausible um, a traditional interpretation of statutory preemption where pipelines are concerned, but where the permitting and the oversight of wells are concerned, uh, I, I believe it'd be horrible public policy. Uh, with regard to intrastate um, uh, storage facilities, the legal situation is different. Um, and there, our recommendation uh, would, would be to, to, to urge uh, FEMSA to do two things. Uh, first, even though the agency is pursuing an interim final rule, which means that they've, they've determined uh, that, that normal public notice and comment procedures don't apply, uh, EDF suggests that FEMSA uh, consider uh, going beyond the minimum procedural requirements and uh, uh, release at, at, at an early date uh, some sort of discussion draft, if, if, even if it's not exactly what ends up being um, put, put, put in the Federal Register later on, we, we believe it would be very useful to all stakeholders uh, to, to, to uh, see such a, su su such a document and, and would encourage uh, FEMSA to think about that. Um, Releasing such a discussion draft would, would be very useful in order to pursue our second suggestion of how uh, FEMSA might, might make use of state expertise in the intrastate uh, uh, context. And that second suggestion is that we hope FEMSA will offer to meet with state regulators soon uh, to begin discussing exactly how the agency will, will determine whether state regulation of intrastate wells are at least as stringent as the minimum federal standards, which is a statutory requirement. Uh, requiring states to adopt federal language uh, word for word is not necessarily the only or the best way to do that, and we believe that the sooner state and federal regulators begin discussing their options, uh, the better. And as to the other question I raised, uh, that, that which was, how can FEMSA base meaningful rules on API documents that are, that are intentionally not all-inclusive and intentionally not intended to, to replace uh, state or federal regs, uh, as, as to how one can ba base a rule on a document like that, uh, EDF has four suggestions to make today. We might have others later. Uh, th three of these four uh, we already see in the, in the discussion draft that uh, California released last week for its rulemaking on uh, gas storage. And, uh, and uh, those three are as follows. Uh, first, uh, that risk management plans should be approved by the agency. 
not only should you require there be risk management plans, but the agency ought to have say so over whether those risk management plans are adequate. Second, uh, risk assessment and prevention protocols that flow out of those plans uh, should be consistent with and additional to other regulatory requirements. That's also in the California draft. And uh, thirdly, that there should be other regulatory requirements. And that I, we, I, I think that's fundamental to the notion of, of the agency uh, you know, be, be, being in charge of the ship. Um, the, the fourth uh, suggestion we would have today uh, for how to, 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 to have actual regulation and yet have it be um, based on a uh, industry standard like the API RPs, which I like, by the way, um, uh, is, is this, and, and that would be to, to define how much risk reduction uh, is needed. That is not uh, an item that was addressed in, in uh, 1170 or 71, and yet it's pretty obvious, if you think about it, that it's not feasible ever to, to re re reduce risk to zero, and it's not going to satisfy anybody if the only increment of risk reduction we get is uh, trivial. So how much risk reduction is enough? Uh, our suggestion here is that uh, the agency rule uh, uh, incorporate uh, either the ALARP uh, idea as low as reasonably practicable or the ALARA idea as low as reasonably achievable. Uh, the, the first one, uh, uh, ALARP, is, is commonly used in uh, industry as, and it's also a central part of some European regulations and ALA a -L -A -R -A, uh, is also uh, uh, used in some regulations. So we would um, and encourage a serious consideration for using one of those two concepts to address the question of how much risk reduction is enough. And with that, I turn it over to Adam. Great, so while we get the uh, PowerPoint back up, and I'll probably need someone's help to do that, um, someone with a password perhaps, uh, I thought I would um, give a little overview uh, and some set context setting for what I'm going to go over. Uh, so I'm going to talk about 14 categories uh, of regulatory elements um, that uh, the states are currently uh, considering. Uh, in a process uh, that has uh, been put together by the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission and the Groundwater Protection Council. For those of you who don't know, those are the two major uh, oil and gas uh, state regulatory associations. Uh, they've both been around for a very long time, and they have done um, uh, a fair number of projects uh, along these lines. Last year, they, they put out a primer on induced seismicity, um, and now they are working on um, uh, gas storage. So uh, they've developed, um, uh, as, as they've been kicking off this process over the past few months, trying to develop a list of um, regulatory elements that they can look at how different states that cover the, the gamut of everything to do with gas storage um, and, and take a look at how uh, different states are addressing these issues and then also use this list as an outline to write up a report to provide recommendations for uh, states and any other entity, um, which in this case would almost certainly be PHMSA, uh, looking to uh, regulate this industry. Uh, so I'm going to walk through, or perhaps given the amount of time, run through the, uh, the 14 categories. Um, there's around, uh, in, in the draft form, around 100 different uh, elements associated with the 14 categories, but um, if if, if the goal was completeness, which, which it was not given um, time constraints, there could have been 1,000 or 5,000 because this is a highly technical area that has a, a lot of considerations. Uh, so, um, so let me get started. Um, this, this image is probably familiar to many of you. This was uh, uh, taken with an infrared uh, camera from an airplane uh, during the height of uh, Aliso Canyon leak. Uh, so, so the first category, and you know, you could almost make the argument the most important is um, permitting, because at the permitting phase, this is when the agency and the operator get together and figure out 
what is this project going to look like uh, uh, down sometimes to great detail uh, related to um, construction and um, uh, instruments in, used in the well uh, and so forth. Uh, so, so here, um, the IOGCC GWPC effort is looking at spacing and siting of new projects, uh, proximity to sensitive areas and structures, uh, an area of review, which is looking at conduits that uh, go through gas storage zones and could potentially uh, cause a migration of, of fluids, gases, um, well design, and I'll return to that momentarily, uh, financial assurance uh, and permit transfer. And, and what I want to highlight in well design is, um, you know, a lot of, as we've uh, been discussing, a lot of the wells that are currently used for gas storage, the, the 17,000 wells, are converted old oil wells. So a lot of the decisions that are made by the, the state oil and gas agencies during the permitting process is, what is, the, uh, what is the condition of these old wells? What are they going to be subjected to over their lifetimes? And have were they constructed well enough and are they in currently in, in good enough shape for this new application? So thinking about um, well conversions is because, you know, so many of these wells are old is, is just as important as figuring out what should go into a new well. Um, two other aspects that, that can go into permitting, it could fall elsewhere, but permitting is a good place to talk about them, are probably two of the more controversial technical issues that have uh, come up over the past uh, few days in, in our, our DOE conversations. Um, one is about the uh, use of emergency uh, safety valves. Uh, those can take the form of subsurface safety valves, which are either uh, subsurface activated or surface activated, and um, surface safety valves. So the que these are things that, you know, they do what they sound like. They, 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 shut, they shut the wells down to some extent. There's uh, not, not completely when, when there's a, a problem. Um, it's, uh, one cannot say that a particular type of valve is appropriate for, for any, any particular well without going pretty deep into technical details. Um, but every state is thinking about, you know, under what circumstances to require them and, and which type to require in which circumstance, um, how often they need to be inspected and calibrated and replaced and so forth. Uh, so I'll move on to, um, well drilling, construction, reconstruction, and conversion. I mentioned conversion, but when, when you know, these, these wells, um, you know, there's 17,000 uh, gas storage wells, right? But there's, uh, you know, millions of production wells. And they're, they're actually uh, built in, um, in pretty similar ways. So the state oil and gas agencies have been regulating for, you know, anywhere up to 100 years or more how to construct, um, how to construct wells. So, so here you're thinking about things like drilling, uh, drilling rules, casing, cementing, um, and cement is, is probably the single most important thing if you want to have a well that has good integrity, which is to say it doesn't leak. You want to make sure that you cement it properly with the right type of cement, and you have enough annular space in between the casing and, 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 the, um, and the formation, and, and the cement needs to have uh, the right properties and, and needs to be mixed properly at the right water temperatures and have the right sort of additives for the, for the zones that they're trying to isolate, and it goes on and on and on. And there's a lot of these very technical issues that the states are thinking about, uh, you know, what are their rules overall and whether they uh, need to be um, uh, adjusted for, for the gas storage context. Um, and um, the, uh, the effort's also looking at uh, string-specific requirements for the surface casing, uh, intermediate casings if, if they're used production casings, and uh, tubing and packer, which reminds me, I was going to talk about tubing and packer a moment ago. I'm going to talk about it right now, because that is uh, probably just as controversial as these uh, safety valves. So, and, and I know that we're going to um, get into uh, tubing and packer a little bit um, later on uh, today, uh, but, but this is, you know, basically putting an additional string of steel inside the production casing um, and having a uh, thing at the bottom uh, to stop at a packer, and then uh, you're filling the annulus with um, with a, a fluid. And by the way, I am a, not an engineer; I'm a lawyer. So, so apologies in advance, but I think this is pretty close to what actually happens. Um, and so, the the good news about tubing and packer is, if you use it, you have an additional barrier of protection, and you have an additional way to um, to monitor whether the well's working uh, as it's supposed to. The bad news about them is, it's an additional piece of equipment. Um, every time you add something, you create new risks. Uh, it's, an, it's a thing that needs to be um, inspected and adjusted over time. 
uh, and it also uh, can reduce uh, uh, flow rates. Uh, so if you put a tubing and packer in a, in a, in a well, sometimes you know, you, you'll need to drill new wells in order to be able to um, have the same input and output to the gas storage field that you do now. Uh, but this is one of the, the, the as I say, the, one of the hottest topics, and, and uh, the states that um, regulate gas storage right now explicitly, uh, most of them have an opinion on tubing and packer. Um, so this third issue came up actually as a question at, uh, towards the end of the day yesterday. What about future wells that are drilled through storage reservoirs? Uh, you have to be careful with this because you're poking a hole in a gas storage reservoir, and you know you could. You know, you, you could accidentally steal the gas, right? As, as you know, happens we were discussing earlier, or um, you could create a perforation that allows gas to escape. You don't want that. So um, uh, many states have regulations on uh, on this, and and all states are thinking about how to make sure that this is done properly. Uh, well operation and maintenance. So this is this is all about making sure that these wells, from the moment they go into service to the moment they go out of service, have integrity. Uh, and that service life can can vary, but uh, you know these wells go on for a long time. The Aliso Canyon well was in in service for o over 40 years. Um, there are gas storage wells in the country that have been in service for over 100 years. Uh, that is not a problem in and of itself. Um, but it does, if you want to have a well that maintains its integrity over 100 years through constant input and output of gas at high pressures uh, over different seasons, then you need to make sure that you're paying attention to the integrity all the time. Um, so, so some of this takes the form of annular pressure monitoring, looking at the different annuli between uh, the casing and the formation and between different casings to see if there are any pressure variations that would indicate that there's a problem. Um, uh, uh, this requires having a, a good maintenance plan in place, and we'll, we'll I'll get to, to, to um, uh, some other sort of maintenance issues in a moment. Um, I think one of the key things in, um, in lifelong well integrity is uh, mechanical integrity testing. This can take lots and lots of forms. Uh, over the past few days, we discussed uh, uh, well over a dozen different tools. Uh, that can be used down hole to measure different aspects of a well's integrity. Uh, you're especially interested in whether the, the casing is staying the way it's supposed to, uh, and whether the cement around the casing is um, is isolating zones and 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 blocking flow of gas. So uh, there, so what the states have to figure out, and 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 this is probably the the third uh, controversial issues after um, safety valves and. Uh, and tubing and packer is what kind of testing to require uh, on which kind of wells, how often. Um, the frequency questions are real bare. Um, and uh, you know what what tests are appropriate under under which circumstances. What conditions should the test be conducted under? How to evaluate whether whether a well uh, passes or fails a test? Figuring out what sort of remediation is appropriate for the well. And this is something that's done in conjunction with the operator. Uh, but this is going to be unique almost at a well um, uh, a well by well basis. So so it's a difficult question to figure out what what should universal standards be and then and then how to uh, make exceptions from them. Uh, so in addition to detecting leaks at the surface or at, uh, subsurface using annular pressure monitoring and, and using these tools, you can also look um, at the surface using uh, sort of newfangled devices that can sniff out methane. Some of them can even quantify methane. Uh, this, this is, I, I understand, to be actually um, at the Aliso Canyon site, and, and uh, that, that, that looks to be a uh, mobile methane monitor. So I know California right now is, is, um, is on several of, it, of the agencies are thinking about what sort of surface leak detection is appropriate. Um, other states, Texas and Kansas, have rules about um, permanent leak detection that needs to go into the wellhead. Um, so, so you need to think about what equipment to require, how often it needs to be tested, what are the thresholds for action, um, and then if you have surface leak detection, uh, what are the protocols for doing it, how often um, uh, uh, sh should, should someone go and, and, and look at the wells. Again, this frequency question is, is, probably, uh, is probably one of the biggest and most difficult to figure out what's appropriate. Uh, this is you know, one of the many places where the agencies need to 
um, weigh the uh, risk of an incident happening against the uh, cost of, of mitigation efforts. Uh, inventory tracking, this is a, a sort of a pretty straightforward one. You want to know how much gas is coming in and going out. Uh, surface facility operations. So uh, this is not a gas storage well. This is, um, this is a production well. Uh, but, you know, you want to maintain these things so that they, so that they look right. Uh, this one does not look right. Um, and so that, that means having a set of procedures uh, to, to go out um, uh, and, and make sure that everything is, uh, is, is hunky-dory. This is something that, you know, the operators do on their own, but it's an area where regulators think, you know, what, what should we be requiring the operators to do uh, in terms of frequency and also in terms of reporting. Um, this is also, uh, you know, a, a good place to, to raise the notion of having to, um, to think about the wellheads. How should the wellheads be constructed? What sort of valves should be on the wellheads? What, how often should you test uh, the different uh, valves, the master valves and other pipeline isolation valves on the wellhead? Um, and the other thing I want to raise here is uh, the wellhead is, is sort of where um, the jurisdictions start to overlap between uh, the oil and gas agencies and the pipeline agencies. Uh, I think a, a good rule of thumb um, is that the vertical portion is um, the oil and gas agencies and the horizontal uh, portion is the, um, the pipeline agencies, but that is not always so. Every state has a slightly different configuration. Um, and the upshot of this is, is you know, the states need to uh, sort of do deep dives internally to figure out who does what and to have good um, memoranda of understanding uh, between the agencies so they can make sure there are no gaps. Um, reservoir integrity. This is, this is a super important one, and this is where, you know, I hope the geologists in the, in the room raise their eyebrows. Uh, this is where you need to make sure that um, your subsurface is behaving how it's supposed to with the gas going in and out and making sure that, you know, especially for um, salt cavern storage, that your salt caverns aren't collapsing. Uh, and this could be done through all sorts of different monitoring uh, requirements that, that agencies can think through, you know, what's appropriate to require. Every uh, facility is going to have a different uh, set of circumstances related to reservoir integrity. So this is going to be uh, a site-specific thing, but there are certain common data elements that agencies will want to collect. Um, emergency, uh, emergency response. Uh, this, this goes back to um, what, what the, the chief was talking about earlier. Having an emergency response plan could not be more essential. Uh, clearly, you know, emergency response is where the, the public is going to see how well is everyone doing. Uh, so having a plan in place um, that explains who does what, um, what are the, you know, what are the different steps for different people, who gets contacted, who's in charge, uh, making sure that's up to date. Uh, that's the, uh, many uh, oil and gas agencies require um, these emergency response plans to be written and updated uh, regularly. Uh, eventually, these wells um, will, you know, they can't last forever. A hundred years is great. You know, a thousand years, maybe not. Um, when these wells, so some of them will just get shut down when a field is shut down. But sometimes, um, uh, you know, you get a problem in a well that is not worth remediating and you want to make a new well. So you have to, um, you have to plug the old wells. Now, states have plugging rules for, uh, that, that apply uh, to uh, all of their uh, oil and gas wells in the state, and usually those plugging rules will apply to gas storage. But again, this is a good opportunity for states to think through whether their plugging rules are doing everything they want them to be doing. Um, and, and this includes, you know, what zone should be isolating, isolated, what, um, you know, should, should casing be pulled, uh, cement blends for, um, uh, for, for plugging, uh, who, who witnesses it and what do they look for? Uh, so there's a lot of technical stuff here, and then, you know, there's also what do you want it to look like afterwards? Um, so public participation. This is uh, uh, not a technical issue in, in the same way that the other ones are, but this is still a key part of any regulatory framework uh, on gas storage. When does the public get to know that, that, that a well is going in or that a change is happening and what sort of input is there? Um, uh, this, this, I think, is, uh, is a Colorado public meeting. Um, uh, for not for gas storage, um, but but for for oil and gas development, these things can sometimes be controversial. But 
uh, people need uh, people need to have a role and to feel that they have a role uh, in order to have a social license uh, to operate. So risk management planning, we've been talking about that a few times. Uh, this is this is a this is a key thing because um, this this is at at the center or, or near the center of the proposed California rule. This is likely to be at the center of a of a FIMSA rule based on what's in API 1170 and 1171. So this is where operators have the opportunity um, to say, here is what's specific to our field. Here is how we're going to mitigate the risks that, that we have. Uh, so as, as, uh, as, as Scott Anderson said, you know, we, we like it ideally when an agency will take these in and approve them because, you know, so what agencies do is they set you know, prescriptive standards or performance standards, and then they'll have something like a risk management plan um, so that, that they can get input from the operators, and then they'll want to weigh whether the operator's risk management plans um, address all the risks and reduce the risks to the state's tolerance uh, equivalent to what the states have offered in their rules. So, so figuring out how to, you know, proactively evaluate um, uh, these plans and work with the operators to make sure that everyone is reducing um, risk to uh, what the what what the agency considers an acceptable amount um, is is truly important. And, and the other thing that I'll I'll add to risk management planning is these are in, these are not and cannot be static documents. You want to make sure that they're updated on a regular basis, um, especially when there is a change in either operating conditions or a change in technology that changes risks or risk control options. Uh, so this one is is, is self-titling um, monitoring wells. You know, you you this is a way to uh, make sure you know what's going on in the reservoir, and a way to make sure uh, that your wells have integrity. It's sort of it's a it's a belt and suspenders on top of the annular pressure monitoring and the frequent testing and the surface leak. Uh, all these things work in tandem to make sure that 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 the um, wells and the facilities are maintaining integrity. But you can um, you can measure all sorts of things by having purpose-built wells either in the gas storage field, or around the gas storage field, and figuring out when these are appropriate and how they should be built and how they should be used, what should be monitored for, what information should be reported, um, et cetera, uh, is, is a key thing that, that, that states are think, thinking about. And, and, you know, I trust that while states are thinking about this, I know FIMS is participating in this effort, too. Um, so over, over the next, say, six to eight months, although, you know, don't hold me to that, and, uh, and, and Rick Simmers from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources is here and is um, co-chairing uh, this effort with uh, Hal Fitch from Michigan, and 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 uh, Rick's going to be giving a presentation uh, on this later this afternoon, which will give some more context, and they'll they'll call for some volunteers if you guys are interested in any of these topics and, and want to give input. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how what states and FIMSA uh, come up with. Uh, in response uh, to uh, to this work, uh, so I think with that, I've covered it all. Okay, thank you very much, Scott and Adam. Appreciate that. Next, we'll from a very important stakeholder we have. Um, you know, we've, we've had a lead up with the response and a lot of the actions of uh, the government agencies and the advocacy community, but now let's hear from a very important advocate that we have, or a, a stakeholder that uh, was directly impacted by uh, Lisa Canyon in particular. So I'm pleased to and appreciative to introduce uh, Paula Cresham, who represents the Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council. Let's see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, it sucks to be the last one before lunch. So, and we're running a little late. So, I'm going to go through this as quickly as we can, and I'll try to jump over some stuff, and then we'll see um, if there's any questions later. We can maybe tackle those. But um, it's actually not the first page, so I'm going to pull this out really quickly. Um, as a community, we were embarrassingly unaware of our surroundings and what was going on in the hills above us. But on October 23rd, everyone got a wake-up call. 
we started chasing the truth and trying to find out what was going on. We got calls going into the gas company over that weekend and we're told nothing had happened. But it was obvious something had happened because the community was completely inundated with the smell of natural gas and the were captains. The following week they did admit that they had a wood leak and we started chasing to see how bad it was. We were told that there was no risk and that no methane would make its way into our community. Something we would later find out was not true. The issue is that we're in a high wind area and we understand that methane being lighter than air, we were, kept told, we were being told it went straight up, but not in Porter Ranch. The winds are significant in Porter Ranch. So everything on that hill was being pushed down into our communities. Not to mention that the more captains are heavier than air, so they were naturally drifting down those canyons, pocketing in areas where we had people getting really, really sick. And the floor camera by the Environmental Defense Fund was the first step in letting us know that. One of the challenges for the community was that that technology existed and it was never shared. And for a community to be left blind when your, your health and your family's health at stake is really, really challenging. So to know that that data was out there and it wasn't being shared with the community was extremely, extremely difficult for us. Uh, we were told that the gas company would have a fix within a couple days, and as we have all heard, that it certainly was not the case. Ultimately, the fix that they tried to do did not work, and it would take four months to dig the relief well. I'm caught up with my notes. Um, we struggled to uh, know even what questions to ask, um, and all kinds of information was being hurled at us. Everything from there's absolutely no risk to your grave risk and you need to leave. And this came from doctors not only just community people and, and experts within the area. We were told that our houses were safe to stay in and that our houses were contaminated and that we need to be relocated as quickly as possible. We kept trying to figure out if it was safe for us or for our kids or for any of our family members and the long-term risks and exposure. The challenge is that we would never be able, no one was ever able to really say that there are no long-term risks to benzene at even these low levels for such a long period of time. And with the wind, which is one of the reasons we'd push for the 24-hour monitoring, with the wind coming down into our community, you would have extended periods of time for this pocket, and then the others, you would have nothing. So those long-term testing and air samplings became a really critical and important part of what we needed to know. We struggled to find if there was any long-term studies, and there aren't. Um, so to know that the community was now going to be the long-term study was a particularly hard hit message that we had to get. Many people continue to get sick and you've heard of all the symptoms that happened and um, there were also rashes for people who had sensitivities to the sulfurs um, that were particularly problematic for a great number of people. And although these symptoms may seem mild to you, and they certainly are not life-threatening, when you experience them for months, and you experience them with your children who are getting sick to their stomach in the house, and it's chronic, it's all the time, that's really, really complicated and a lot more difficult than just this simple list of minor ailments. Imagine having the flu for four months. Imagine having a really bad cold for four months, um, or having a headache for four months. These are the things that the community was experiencing and really struggling with. Then the oily mist coming down from the community. Um, we struggled a long time to find out what that was and finally um, the county health department did a study and that was extremely helpful to get that data. The community was torn apart um, because it's such an odd thing that everyone doesn't experience these symptoms. The symptoms were not felt by certain people and felt right by other people. So the ones who weren't suffering any symptoms um, questioned those who were and the people who um, were suffering were mad because of the casual attitude and, and really angered by the casual attitude of those people who weren't suffering symptoms. So you had these two people diametrically opposed. And then when you come to relocating the school, you had people who my kids aren't having any symptoms, we're not having any symptoms, and we do not want our kids' education interrupted, keep the school where it is, and then families who were extremely concerned about the long-term risks or their families were experiencing symptoms. And another reason schools had to be relocated was teachers were experiencing symptoms and they were having a hard time keeping teachers within the classrooms. So you had these people just continually battling each other and battling each other within the community um, over this blowout and that was extremely difficult. We heard that at the meeting on November 2nd and then December um, and those sort of things. 
Ultimately, we would see about half of our families in the community move out. Um, that uh, is about 16,000 people out of a community of 32,000. Um, we would see two schools relocated, parks that were closed down for a long period of time until they could be deemed safe and clean for the kids to come back in. We saw businesses closed from day to day due to illness of illnesses of their employees that just couldn't come to work and they didn't have enough people to staff, so they would have to close their doors. And many of our small businesses struggled to stay open because half of their client base had moved out of the community. So if you were going to get your cleaning done or pick up a prescription, you're not going to drive back into a community to pick it up. You're going to pick it up where you are. And that hit them pretty hard, and they're still reeling from that. Um, the Porter Ranch Council, um, the Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council um, was one of the first to um, start setting up meetings just from a community standpoint because we were there. Our first meeting was with the county and the fire department in my office um, on October 30th where we discussed the need for the health department to come in. Um, up until that point, they'd not been called in because there was no official health risk. Um, but there were health concerns, and we definitely wanted to see that those were addressed with the community. Um, and also, we started having the discussion about the gas company paying for the relocation of the families. We hosted the first meeting um, on November 2nd, and a, a number of other meetings after that were thousands of attend thousands attended, and they were lively meetings. People are scared. There's so much misinformation and non-information, um, and so those meetings, we, we really tried to start communicating more via email rather than bringing the public together because it actually became a public risk for us to meet together. We reached out to the elected officials regarding the coordination with all of the, the agencies that we needed to have, and then we met with Governor Brown on January 4th. The county, you've heard all of the things that they've done, and they were absolutely amazing during the process. Um, although it took a little bit of time to help them understand the need for some of the testing that the community wanted because they're scientists and they're data driven. So according to, to the data, there was no health risk. Benzene wasn't a risk. And yet you have a community that is terrified of the future for their children and their elderly family members and what to do next. And so it was great that they jumped in and did all that. Um, the city has filed lawsuits and city attorney, district attorneys filed criminal charges and uh, the city stepped up. The state regulators, of course, um, the Declaration of Emergency on January 6th, and they had promised more oversight um, through the governor's office, which was well-meaning. However, it's not as successful as it could be, and if there's a message that we really want everyone to have is this created such an issue for the public because you guys know the alphabet soup. You know who all is doing what, but we don't. And so we would call someone and ask a question, and, oh, that's not me. Who is that? I don't know. Well, there's this six inches, and it's this person, but then this, it's just so complicated for the community. Um, and then we started um, reaching out to our fed federal lawmakers to look at federal laws. Um, and then, of course, President Obama has um, created a task force to investigate. Uh, grassroots groups were absolutely active, Save Porter Ranch. Um, their message was to shut it all down, and they were absolutely active during that. The learning curve for the community was huge um, because, once again, we're not oil people, we're not gas people, um, we're just living in a community, and many had just found out for the first time that there was these sites above them. So we had to learn about VOCs, relief wells, uh, airborne metals, um, that SS-25 and where it was and how it worked um, and the number of wells that were up there, many of them dating back to 1938, which just seems scary. And I know for you guys, you feel like a well that's 100 years old may not be a big deal, but for us, um, it just seems scary when it's not even it's at, at its original intent. It's being used for something else. Um, and just challenge that the oversight might not have been what certainly as a community we had expected it to be. On February 18th, um, on February 18th, it was finally sealed in what would now be considered the worst natural gas leak in the terms of environmental impact had been, has, was done. Um, and the community had, has endured four long months of exposure to the gases and the metals, not only them, but their homes. As Katie mentioned, their homes were sitting there even though some of the families were relocated, um, many of them experiencing the same symptoms. 
um, looking to the future, we continue to struggle with the gas company and getting bills paid and their continued support for the community. Um, there's a long-term health study, which we are hoping we will not see any results of in five to 10 years, maybe 20 years, that we will not see anything, everything will be fine. We're still waiting on the testing results from the water and the soil for Southern California Gas Company to comply with the directives of the county. We continue to work on legislation and evaluating the safety and the possible relocation of the site. Uh, we're awaiting the results of the president's investigation. Uh, we're working with the mayor on a sustainability plan. Um, he has a substantial, substantial sustainability plan that we want to do within the community. And we are working um, to see that the fines that are levied against the gas company come back to the community. The impact on the community has been significant. And those fines, we believe, should come back to the community to help rebuild and restore the community for which it was damaged. Um, for the community, once again, how to build our, rebuild our small businesses, um, unifying our community, which is, as I mentioned before, such a big deal since everyone didn't experience the same thing, everyone's response wasn't the same, and it's caused an enormous rift in our community that still exists. And the name of the poor ranch, which one time meant just an amazing community, now has a stain on it. And so we really have to work to make sure that we can remove that stain and restore the community. So it's not just restoring a damaged building. It's restoring a property value. It's restoring their trust in the community, their faith in the community, people not being fearful to come back to the community. Those are the things we're really concerned about. And we know we have a long way to go because we want to make sure that our children and our families living in the area don't have to fear what would happen next. Some of what we've learned is that the government agencies are a little bit more reactive than proactive. <laughs> that the agencies like Southern California Gas um, are not willing to share all the information that they have, and this existed with some of the other uh, regulatory agencies as well. And that there was no unified command, and as I said, this was devastating to the community and required us to do a version of button, button, who's got the button, who's got what, where are we supposed to go? It, it was challenging beyond belief to not have a place to go and to know that there was someone really navigating this crisis for us that knew everything that was going on. And agencies do what they do, and they seemed ill-equipped to handle this crisis. It wasn't there was a plan for any of them, not just SoCal Gas, but there wasn't a plan for any of the agencies on how to interact, how to communicate with one another, and how to communicate with the community who really is sitting there on the edge of their seats waiting to be told what to do next, how to respond, and what the risks are. Um, let me make sure I go here. Just that also that the agencies and the uh, utility would spoon feed us as little information as we, they believed we would tolerate. So we had to really fight and struggle and push to get all the information that we can get. And make sure that the questions that they're answering are actually the questions that we're asked, that we were asking them. Um, and we have to continue to be aware of what's around us. There's a number of facilities up there. Termo, who owns a number of the wells up there, actually leaked natural gas, the byproduct of pumping oil, once again, something we all didn't know, um, actually leaked, leaked the natural gas that was coming off of their site since, SS, since the well was shut down, or the reservoir was shut down. They just leaked it out into the air during the, um, during the crisis. Crimson Resource had another, com another company up there, had a leak of both gas and oil. They did not report it. Southern California Gas ended up reporting it for them. And that we may have to just live with minor leaks being part of what's happening in our community. Um, even the work that they're doing now and bringing in the work over rigs, there is just occasional release of gas. And for us to understand that that's just going to be part of what our future is, that we're just going to be that's what we're going to smell is challenging. But to know that that's going to be what we're going to smell and not know that that site's being monitored correctly, those are two completely different things. Um, we know that the future of the site's still being navigated um, and that we understand the importance of reliability, but it can't come at the risk of this community. So finding a way to make that site safe and make that site provide the reliability that needs to happen for Southern California, we understand, but somehow there needs to be a better system in place of communicating to the residents and making sure that our assumption was that everyone was continuing to look at these sites, to look at all the wells and make sure that they were maintained and upgraded. Um, and it felt like they were just comfortable sitting 
on a well that's 100 years old and doing just a sound and temperature test and not really testing the absolute integrity of those wells. So with that, I just want to say thank you for having me. Um, we do want you to know that the impact was huge. We know that there was no incredible images to be seen, and I think that was part of the slow response, is that it was invisible. So people looked out there, and it was gorgeous um, up there on the hill, but people were getting sick. So just thank you and for your attention to our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Appreciate that perspective on the impacts. So certainly it was incredible, so appreciate your perspective. Um, with that, we are at our Q&A period. We're going to have an abbreviated question and answer period, and then uh, we'll probably go to lunch maybe, maybe five minutes late. We'll see how it goes, but uh, I guess we'll start with uh, are there any questions. If you do have a question, we have two microphones over here, or if there are any questions that were written. We also have a roving mic in the back for those we can also use. How about any questions from the web? Okay. All right. Here we go. One question. Uh, you can count on me for questions on the Lisa Appreciate Canyon. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, uh, Catherine Moore, uh, I work in the California Legislature for the Senate Natural Resources and Water Committee. Um, this question is for uh, Chief Jones. There are uh, two other gas storage facilities in Los Angeles County. Um, could you talk about how you would perhaps respond differently in the future in the event of a natural gas leak that might be persistent from one of the storage wells? Well, I certainly think we'd get a handle on it relatively quicker in, in terms of managing the situation. I, um, I think from from the fire perspective, you know, we, we certainly uh, have started looking at these kind of facilities and what role we have to play in overseeing and regulating them. And, um, you know, if another situation were, were to occur, we obviously have our recent experiences and our recent uh, lessons uh, to go off of. And, you know, I think the important thing here is, is what we do going forward in terms of uh, the risk management plans, the emergency plans, uh, the communication elements of, of those plans and, and who's going to be responsible for it because the worst thing that could happen here is everybody go back to their silos and do what they do every day. If we don't communicate and pre-plan, we're going to have another situation like we had here. So my comment on this is, for instance, if Dogger is developing a risk management plan uh, that the locals need to be involved with that risk management plan and, and perhaps even involved in developing some of the uh, drills or tabletops or whatever the case might be uh, from that. And when you talk about risk management plans, from our perspective, it, it covers a wide gamut of requirements in what I mentioned earlier, was, which is our uh, CalARP regulations in California, the Accidental Release Prevention Plans. And we've been doing that for 30 years or for 20 years. and and uh, we're, we're actually still growing in that area because of the uh, refinery releases that we've had in California, in Richmond, California, a couple years back, and then most notably the ExxonMobil in, in the city of Torrance. And so I, I think all of these collectively uh, are contributing to uh, a mindset uh, that we have to, uh, you know, keep away from our silo type of approach and, and start interacting uh, more aggressively, both at the local level and the state level, and, and certainly uh, other stakeholders. And and I think uh, you know the one thing that uh, we really have to uh, engage in is that community uh, portion of it to make sure that the communities are involved too, because they do have some uh, good feedback and good input into that kind of process. Uh, uh, thank you. I also have a, a question for Katie. You mentioned going up onto the site to. Uh, uh, take samples uh, to try and identify the source of some of the compounds that you were seeing in people's homes. Um, were you able to obtain from SoCal Gas or their contractors uh, the composition of, of some of the fluids that were being used in the well kill attempts? So we, uh, 
We obtained the material safety data sheets of the drilling fluid or the drilling materials, uh, but we did not obtain um, actual samples of of the fluids themselves. And so that's something we've requested. We have not received that. The uh, the MSDS sheets won't have uh, the trade secret chemical information, mm -hmm. correct? Just the symptoms associated. In the general. Right. That, that's right. The material safety data sheets, and a lot of times they'll list proprietary ingredients as well, so they won't have the full listing. So we had to base our chemical analysis list on what we know about drilling muds, what we know about the industry, what we know we typically find in crude oil and natural gas, because we didn't have that source information. Thank you. I have a question actually for, for Paula to, uh, you know, you were the leader of the Civic Association and this was dropped on your lap and I know you described the impacts on the community, but what about the impact on you as the leader? You have, and also do you have advice for other civic leaders? Oh, that's hysterical. Um, uh, <laughs> I worked about 80 hours a week, um, seven days a week during the, um, during the week. Uh, and you're just trying to find people who will help you and give you information. Um, you traditionally find one person at each agency who's responsive. Um, you get poo-pooed <laughs> by a lot of agencies because you're just a community. Um, they, the symptoms were not um, something that a lot of people cared about. Uh, they thought they were minor. Um, and plus, you had just the disparity of symptoms. So. Um, that was challenging, um, but I think that someone has to sound the alarm and someone has to beat the drum. It just things don't happen on their own. They don't. They have to have engagement. Um, it's the same with everything. But when you have a crisis, someone has to. So we became sort of the holder of the strings of all the agencies to try to find some sort of a connection so the community had at least someone to go to so that we can try to figure it out. But even within the agencies, you would ask them a question and they did not know who would be the right person to answer that question. And that was shocking. I think our expectation was that they were more connected um, and more informed of their industry. But they were perfectly comfortable saying, this is my piece and I know everything about this piece. I don't need to know about this piece or this piece. And so for community, that's, that's devastating. Appreciate it. Anyone else? I guess we'll, since I have the podium, I'll ask one quick question of Katie. I, I know it's been mentioned a couple of times related to the Mercaptan and the separation issue. Did, was there, can you talk to that or any, I guess, attempt to quantify that? I mean, it looks like your readings were all really nil, but you know, could you t speak to that issue there? Right. right, so we did explore um, some more innovative ways in discussions with experts in other laboratories on how we might be able to uh, employ some newer methods uh, of sampling or laboratory sampling methods that would allow us to measure down to the low levels that people were, were smelling. Um, but in the end, we didn't pursue them because um, you know, they're not approved methods, they haven't been tested. Um, so it's some, it, it is a further area that, that requires research so that um, we can measure things accurately and be able to understand trends. And because as Paula pointed out, you know, the mercaptan and the other sulfur odorants, they are heavier and they, they, they travel differently. So just, you know, their physical property is so different. So even though we used methane as an indicator, um, it's, it's not the best indicator because it has very different physical properties. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is that it for questions for the morning session? Let's have another round of applause for the panelists this morning. I think I share everyone's view and that it's very informative. We'll now break for lunch. The afternoon we'll look forward to a more technical focus. Uh, we'll hear from operators and then a lot of the technology piece of it. But uh, so we'll break now for lunch and we'll come back at 1.15 local time. Thank you.